Coming from a military background, most of my posts have been military related. I've relied heavily on my own experience, and it's worked out pretty well. This is my first try at a non-kill all the Xeno story. I really hope you enjoy it. BTW, the inspiration from this story was taken from my roommate's dogs, Rhino and Scout. It had been three years since the Karn had declared war on the Terrans. Three years they had been starved of any outside resources. Yet, here they were, still smug as could be, on the council floor, beseeching for support. We have only laid claim to one system, the Terran ambassador shouted, one. The closest system to our own. The Kern are thousands of light years away from their homeworld, have thousands of systems colonized, and when we lay claim to one system, they slap an embargo on us, and it went unopposed. The Terran ambassador looked tired from his speech. He had been going at it for nearly an hour. Kern ambassador Cly had been bored for 50 minutes of it, so he was playing a game on his tablet, when the Terran ambassador pointed a finger at him. If they only knew what we were capable of, they would grant us this single system allow us to flourish. There is much humanity has to offer the galaxy, but none have even bothered to give us a chance. Cly, without taking his eyes off his game, was dismissive and wholeheartedly joking when he said, then invite me to dinner. Laughter was heard throughout the room. Kern were an opportunistic predator species, known for insatiable appetites. He was nearly through the level. Just a few more blocks and he'd unlock the next. It's a date, the Terran ambassador said. The room hushed, breaking Cly's trance. He was about to resume his game when he realized what had just been said. He double-checked his translator, which confirmed his suspicions. The Terran had just accepted his request for dinner. The distraction caused him to lose his game. Frustrated, he threw up his hands. Fine. I'll dine with your people. Let us see your world and what you have to offer. Be forewarned, a small pack of Kern could eat an entire wolfa. There was more laughter, but the damage had been done. Cly would have to start his game from the beginning. At least he might get a snack out of it. Their physical tolerances being similar, Cly did not require an environment suit to visit Earth. Cly was taken from the spaceport in a vehicle that seemed at the time too large for their ground paths, but it navigated them with ease. Several human guards were positioned on two wheeled vehicles, escorting his own to the ambassador's residence. The flashing lights were a nuisance, but he came to ignore them as he resumed playing the game on his tablet. When his envoy arrived, the Terran ambassador greeted him. His translator indicated that he was dressed in what would be considered casual. He had remembered almost too late as they arrived at his residence to look up the ambassador's name. Cly was introduced by David Johansson to his wife, Mary, his children, Joseph and Aaron, and his dogs, Scratch and Sniff. All of them were very cordial except the dogs, who kept their distance, growling at him when he approached them or came near anyone except David. It was curious, but Cly was preoccupied. Johansson prompted Cly to take a seat at the dinner table, which he did. The house was impressively large. However, it was a mishmash of technology. They had terminals on nearly every wall, yet one had the sole purpose of controlling a fire pit in the middle of what David called the living room. His confusion was further exasperated when he was told that the whole house was equipped with environmental control. So, Cly, I understand from my briefing that the Kern are strictly carnivores. We'll be having several courses, but I assure you that yours will only consist of meat. Ah, there's your shrimp cocktail now. A platter of tiny seafood was presented to him, with a saucer in the middle. It prompted him to inquire as to the nature of the sauce. Ah, that is actually vegetable-based. The shrimp are holy meat, but if you wish, you can flavor them with the sauce. I personally love it, but I'll understand if it puts you off, David said. The rest of the family, save the dogs, were served a plate of green plant matter adorned with various toppings. Cly ate a shrimp and was pleased with its flavor. Out of courtesy, he tried one in the sauce, but something about it burned his throat, so he refrained from trying any more. He was finished with the platter by the time the humans were halfway done with theirs. To David, he corrected himself, I am sorry, but we Kern have large appetites. I thank you for dinner, but I'm afraid this has only whetted my appetite. Ambassador Cly. That's the point. We've much, much more food on its way. Please, he gestured for him to remain seated while we wait. Please tell us about your people. 
My children have never met someone who wasn't from Earth. Cly spent a few minutes describing his homeworld, their habits, how they were raised. When he got to their right to adulthood, he spent a while explaining the hunt and how it changed them from children to adults. He expected his children to be frightened from the savage story, but they listened eagerly. When he finished, David's son, David's son Joseph, Amir Welp, spoke. Dad took me bow hunting last year. We got that buck over there. Cly's eyes followed the child's outstretched finger to a large animal's head, mounted on a wall in the living room. It was monstrous, having twelve spears protruding from its endoskeleton. Cly imagined the beast with the rest of its body, and estimated that it was easily twice the size of David, and many times that of Joseph. What is a bow? He asked. Ooh, Dad. Can I show him? Joseph begged. Maybe after dinner, son, his father smiled. Cly's stomach rumbled, and just as he was beginning to wonder about getting more food, more was brought out on platters. So, Cly, I'm not terribly sure just how much you actually eat, so we ordered a pig roast. There's plenty more, so if you're hungry, just let the caterers know and they'll bring you as much as you want. Cly bit into the pig and never felt so much bliss in his life. It was juicy, full of flavor, and the vegetable sauce served with this one made it so much better. He had three plates full of the animal before he was sated. It was then that he noticed that the children were having a fourth. After he was introduced to several more courses, the most interesting one being dessert, Cly felt like he would sleep for ages. He watched as the children played in the living room with the dogs, before Joseph brought forth his bow. How are you supposed to kill an animal with this? He asked. Joseph demonstrated that a small sliver of wood with a sharp bit of metal was fitted onto the string, and you pulled it back. The elasticity of the string brought it back to its resting position, but in doing so, propelled the shaft of wood forward. It didn't seem like it would do a terrible amount of damage. Oh, it doesn't. We had to track that guy for six miles before we found him. Then we had to clean him there because he weighed so much. Cly was in disbelief. That animal could easily have weighed twice his own weight. To think that this child and his father slayed this animal with such a primitive weapon and then carried it out of the wilderness, back to be butchered and frozen was unimaginable. Okay, I'm going to go play with Scratch and Sniff now, he said before running off. It was then that Cly noticed something unnerving. The dogs were pets obviously, but they could easily kill little Joseph if they wanted. Cly would even have considered them worthy prey. Instead of exercising caution, Joseph charged at them with his hands raised as though he were going to attack. They responded by nipping at him with their powerful jaws, but stopping short of any injury whatsoever. What's wrong? David asked. Your dogs. They could kill him easily, yet even when he acts aggressively, they only pretend to harm him. They are insentient, so how do they know not to harm him? David seemed to think for a while, then replied. Dogs were the first animals we as humans domesticated. We fed them, took care of them, and in return, they lend us their enhanced hearing and sense of smell, letting us know of danger before we would have known about it. After a while, they just became our friends. There's some dogs that people use for hunting, but for the most part, we feed them, and they treat us like we're family and we do the same. Cly felt drowsy from the meat and wasn't sure if he were actually dreaming or awake. They're playing. David laughed. Of course. Now if you were to do what Joseph did, they wouldn't take kindly to it. You're not part of their pack, as they see us. They'd most likely attack you. Cly was taken aback. You mean they would attack me? I'm your guest. They know that. If you hadn't walked inside with me, they would have considered you an intruder. Scratch over there is part German Shepherd Dot. He's very intelligent as far as dogs go. Sniff is a Yorkie. Sniff would have alerted Scratch that you were coming, and Scratch would have probably ambushed you. They're a great guard dog combination, he said smugly. The dogs were locked in mortal combat, growling and snapping at each other with more ferocity than they had greeted Cly, even being an interloper as David said. Sniff bit Scratch's ear a little too hard, which resulted in an escalation. Scratch barked loudly, angrily. David turned his head sharply, and as nonchalantly as he could, yelled, no. Both immediately and obediently stopped and sat on their hind legs. They understand you? Cly asked, astounded. They understand no food and outside. That's about it. Be nice. David called. 
They resumed their mock combat, their play. Why does the large one not eat the small one? David shook his head in confusion. I don't know myself sometimes. Sniff sometimes irritates Cratch, but they might as well be brothers, you know. No, I don't. David's communication device beeped at him, which he tapped to silence. A moment later, he looked at Clyde curiously. Hey, have you ever seen a game of football? At what David called halftime, Cly had a serious question. David, you've shown me much. Your people cling to their past and look forward to the future. Not only that, you've shown me that yours are more than capable hunters. I'm very confused, however. David nodded patiently, waiting. Why have you kept this dispute in the council? Why not engage in war to claim your system? David sat quietly for a moment, taking a sip of ethanol before responding. We, as humans, have caused so much war among ourselves, we want to try our best to exhaust every diplomatic avenue that we can before we resort to it. I don't want to think of Joseph over there carrying a rifle and fighting on a world he cares nothing for. I want him to grow up appreciating that we have the capacity to not resort to such violence. Within a week record time Cly had pushed forth the paperwork necessary to offer the Terrans Alpha Centauri as a gift. The humans had been engaged in more hunts, more combat, and more war than the Kern could comprehend so much that they had actually grown bored of it and wanted to try their hands at diplomacy, rather than what they were actually good at, which was killing everything in their path. Their games were more violent than some of the most dangerous hunts he had attended. So they got Alpha Centauri without question. And they'd get the next hundred systems from the Kern without question or opposition, so long as they continued asking nicely. This content is Creative Commons, relevant attribution can be found in the description. Thanks for watching.